Today, uh, I've been asked to tell you a little bit about uh, my perspective on how or yeah, how we are or how we could respond to the refugee crisis that we are seeing coming up in Europe and that we have been working in uh, for the last several years but rather focused on the last half part of 2015 where everything was getting rather busy in, uh, in <coughs> islands around Greece. Um, just not because I'm the center point of, of this, but maybe to understand what is my perspective. Um, I'm working in uh, the Danish Disaster Management Department. Um, I'm working uh, coordinating our response, global response capacity in the Danish Red Cross. That means that I have the responsibility of training uh, all our experts, I have the responsibility of uh, getting all our technical gear, inclusive uh, huge base camps operations, everything deployable in 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so in my daily work, I'm very much in preparedness. Um, and a warehouse manager, maybe the best educated warehouse manager, um, at least in Denmark. <laughs> um, when things is happening, I have the honor of being the first search capacity of the department. So I'm running for the FACT team, I'm running for our own uh, bilateral operation. So I have a lot of different tasks uh, to fulfill or to be able to fulfill. One of the most important one is the operation manager task that is a little bit uh, a very uh, cross-sector uh, person that is able to, to play a little bit with everything and call in uh, the experts if needed, uh, if I can't manage myself. Uh, in my past I have uh, I've been in the army, I've been teaching children, I have been uh, fundraising in Dentures Aid, making uh, mine clearance in Eritrea from Dentures Aid. I am teaching at the Danish Emergency Management Agency I even have a, a university degree in disaster management. So what I'll be telling you tonight is my absolutely personal perspective and my absolute personal learning points. I'll probably have to discuss some of these learning points even in my own organization. And maybe with some of you, that, that's fair enough. I don't <coughs> insist on knowing everything about everything. I am just the guy that they sent down on the ground uh, and want things to move. I was on Lesbos in... Uh, I came directly from Nepal to Lesbos where I landed in uh, when it was when it peaked. Uh, 10,000 refugees was coming in on the beach every day. On the first night I arrived in a small transit site run by a pop-up NGO. Uh, they was having 10,000 people through this site a day. 3,000 square meter of crappy uh, parking lot outside uh, a restaurant called Oxy. Uh, so that was the name of the site, that was Oxy. Uh, and when I arrived the first night, uh, two Afghan guys stabbed each other and died in the arms of uh, my girlfriend here, one of them, and uh, I was a little bit shaked. You can say you just flew in from well-organized Nepal, normal natural disaster, something with a lot of logistic and long-term planning, and, well, and then you just dump down into a, a site where you have five, eight thousand refugees in the <coughs> night, wet, cold, windy, no shelter, uh, a little bit of food, um, like this, this is oxy. Um, 
one week later, UNHR came and set up that love hall, just to be nice. So the point is, this operation was run by pop-up NGOs. NGOs that have popped up out of nothing, or maybe out of the need that was very, very visible. Uh, they was uh, Im they impressed me, and I, I, to be honest, I will praise them tonight. At least one of them, uh, Starfish, that was running this site. This uh, is the story about Melinda. Maybe you have read the story about the the restaurant owner Melinda from from Mollywash that had a small restaurant, and uh, from that have started up all this uh, helping the refugees coming in because no one was doing nothing. So she just took all the young girls, especially young girls, a little bit of young men, coming on holiday, and um, just ask them, come and help me. And they did. And they established a group called Starfish, or later they named it Starfish, because that is one of the, the characteristics uh, with all these groups, that they have, they have nothing, there's no structure. Okay? I'm from the Red Cross, I can tell you we have structures. We are crazy with structures, so much that sometimes we are dying in these structures. But these groups have no structures. They have a lot of individuals, they have a lot of hands, they have a lot of heart, and they have uh, an impressively amount of funding. Uh, not funding from ECHO, but funding from moms and uncles, and they just they just post something on Facebook and tell people to send them some money, and then they send some money. And there are no accountability. It's nothing. So, coming from this well-organized world of the Red Cross, <laughs> this can only be, there must be fraud somewhere. There must be something wrong. Uh, and Probably there are something here and there. But these guys and girls, they run this side. When I mean, they, they ran this side. When I came in, 10,000 people was coming through this side. 3,000 square meters. To those of you who knows a little bit about sphere and uh, how much do we need for, for a transit site, we need approximately 10, 15 square meters per person coming through. Uh, so we should have had 100,000 square meters. They had 3,000 square meters. But they organized. All these refugees was queued up, and they came to a, to a small tent, or one of the small UNHCR houses, and then they got a ticket um, for the bus that these volunteers have organized. They have they've organized a bus operation moving these 10,000 refugees from the site to uh, the, the camps uh, in, the, in the south of the island. <coughs> when I arrived, IRC had taken over the bus operation. So IRC was standing with all the buses and um, <coughs> I think the volunteers was very happy to not have to deal with all these buses, at least uh, if not for anything else than for the money. But the refugees were coming, they got a ticket, so they have a, 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 they, they handed out 10,000 tickets a day. You can imagine uh, just to do this on scratch, there was no system. They just have a lot of uh, colored paper. And uh, I think they have 10 different colors. And then they realized after some times that they could not even just move on colors. So they started making small, nice drawings. So they had the red one with the sun. And then they had the red one with the goat. And the red one with the starfish. And the red one. And it was, <laughs> I was smiling a little bit. But, but it was a lot of heart in this. It was exactly like we are doing when we are doing it. As something in the school or something. But the point is they did it. And they switched off, on and off. They delivered this organizing so people 
the first comers would move the buses. And if someone was had special needs, then they had special tickets for them, so they could be in front of the line. And they know nothing about humanitarian standards. But they have realized that broken legs and so on, nice to get them in front, children up front, and so on. They also organized a meal for every refugee. Hmm. It was, yeah, now we are talking, right? A meal for every refugee, not a nice and healthy meal. They got a half a liter of water, they got an apple or a banana, and they got a sandwich, white bread, but they got a meal. And you can start thinking, if you was able to have an operation running where they was able to scale up from 500 to 10,000 a day without getting crazy, but they did. Because sometimes the Turkish side just closed the border, and then we had a day with no one. Uh, when they was negotiating with the, with the European, uh, the Turkish president just wanted to show that he could, he was in control of the trigger, so he just closed the border. So we had three days without refugees. And then the negotiations was not going as well as he wanted, so he just opened up and we got 15,000 on the next day. And see, these volunteers with no organization, no structures, no procedures, no paper, nothing, Scaling up a food operation from zero to 15,000, like this, on demand. I am sure that the Red Cross could not handle to do this. Uh, I think we, was, we would have shifted operation <coughs> managers and people every three weeks or something like that, because we were speaking. Either we would not get error, or we would have too much food left over. Um, but they managed to, to do this. So, my first experience was learn to change our to change our <coughs> attitude. Because we were standing like this in the beginning. Uh, the Red Cross, the IRC, the UNHCR, everyone, all the yogurt, all the actors that we know from the scene standing like this. I see we're standing like this. We have some buses. You can take care of this with volunteer. We was crazy and we was afraid. We was afraid of getting involved because they broke the law sometimes. Uh, the, the site was not properly signed. They didn't own the land. There was a lot of all these legal issues about so everyone was, it was untouchable. Um, after one week or so, I realized that maybe we had to change our attitude. So I shifted from, from standing outside and walked inside and do, did exactly what I, I tried to do the same as I'm doing in a Red Cross operation where I'm coming to a national society, a capacity building and so on. So I just moved into this group of volunteers and said, okay, I know, I have the knowledge, I have the experience, you have the hands and the hearts, what do you need, what do you want from me? Ah, we have this problem about security in the camp, they have, we have staffings, can we maybe uh, have a look at that? Yeah, we can have a look at that. So we started reorganizing all the lines and everything. And in two or three weeks, I was in, and the quality of the work was improving uh, like this. Um, I tried to, to list up uh, the characteristics and all of us that is working in this business can start thinking about where this is, uh, is complementary to our side or maybe we are weak on some of the sides. They are definitely needs driven. They are so, need, they are so highly needs driven that they can close down the regression without trying. That's also a thing that at least the old ones, we are a little bit, it's a little bit hard to close down. But then we have to deliver back our contracts. So, but they just closed down auction. 
when IRC, after one year, managed to build up a site, and it's not to complain about IRC, it's just to, to tell you that they was <coughs> having all the legal documents and they made a very, very nice and well-organized site, but it took so long time. But when it was there, they closed down Oxy, this organization. And then they moved to Moria, to one of the worst camps in, uh, in the southern part of them. Just moved all the volunteers and all the resources down to another area where there was need. So they was able, they was uh, flexible. They was innovative. They just invented a ticket system. Um, on the spot, everything was invented. They had no clue about how to do this. They just invented everything from bottom up. And it was not the worst camp I have seen in my life when I arrived. It was okay. Could be better. It was okay. They had absolutely no bureaucracy. No paper at all. Um, They, was, they are created by social media, so we will probably see a lot of this also outside Europe when we have a growing middle class mm -hmm. in, a, in the Asia, especially particularly in the Asia region. I'm sure we will see exactly the same happening in the, in the future. More of this. They, uh, they don't want a new logo, so don't try to approach them and say, okay, you can be my volunteer, <laughs> so you can get my t-shirt. That's a logo. That's not what they want. But they want my knowledge. They want to be better. And uh, that was just uh, to the next speaker. They maybe want your, should have your, your, your diary. I think that would be, uh, they would love it. Uh, they was asking me, they was calling me, can you come? We, we need a mass incident management system <laughs> on the island. We had three or four doctor, teams of doctors moving around. They didn't have, they have not even made a, they have not even sexualized the, the island. It was just moving around. Uh, we are doctors, but we don't know how to, to deal with the, with the mass incident. So we moved in, sat down, made a plan, and advised on how to do this. So they want to, 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 to use the knowledge we have. Uh, of course, they don't know the unwritten laws. They don't know what UNHCR is saying. They don't know the language. Uh, we had one meeting. After, after three weeks down there, we managed to let, make a coordination meeting with the volunteers. Um, they was totally a uh, waste of time. And I said, oh, let's try just one meeting. And in that meeting, there was two options. UNHCR could kill them, or UNHCR could just shut up and let them live. And he shut up. He was totally silent. Uh, and he was not grilling any, any one of the volunteers. He could have been doing that. And they came out of the meeting and said, ah, there was a, ah, a bad meeting. We, was, we, we had no discussion with the UNHCR. Ah, so you haven't. You don't know the language. The language from UNHCR in this case is no word, that means that you just move on. You are accepted to move on. <coughs> so, so, so they need all these kinds. They have no financial bindings. They can move the operation. They have, don't have a donor saying that you should use the money for, for food. Uh, they just use the money. And, and of course, you can discuss the accountability issue and so on. But nevertheless, flexible. Uh, they have no need for flag waving. I think they were half a year old before they got a name. And uh, they, they, they also uh, discussed for a long time if they should have a logo. So they don't need the flag waving. Um, that is, uh, but they know the reality, and that was maybe the most important thing. Everyone on the island that was coming in, and we didn't know anything about what's going on on the island. We didn't know anything about the locals. The local population on Vespas was totally forgotten. Um, but these groups was a part of the local, also a part of the local. So there was a lot of things. And I think my basic uh, point is uh, that we need to change our attitude. It must be possible to, 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 to use them <coughs> in a positive
us to it <coughs> without getting involved in the illegal part of the business. I'll be back to that part. The second one is um, refugees on the move. Um, I've never ever seen a speech in the uh, in the beneficiaries like this. They was moving with an incredible high speed. And just to to realize, it takes. I've I've talked I've I've spoken to one of the refugees that I met on Lesbos. 18 days later, he was in Denmark as an asylum seeker. 18 days, hmm. walking with two children. They have a speed that is incredible, and they have there is a force in this. You have 10,000 people coming through a site, so you couldn't even make a first aid stand here because it was simply moving faster than you could handle everything. So you had to start moving around. And all our services have to move around. We have to move everything. We have to rethink all the idea. Everyone will think, yeah, we can have our, we can have our container, we can have our tent, we can have our flag, we can be here, and then they can come to us, and then they can go back to the tent. It's, it's a classic uh, refugee camp setting thinking that we was uh, trapped into. Um, but this was not like this. I had one night a, 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 a guy that was coming to me. We was restoring family links, and he was coming to me. Uh, he had lost contact with his wife. He had taken one boat here, and the wife had taken another boat here, and maybe the boat had not, and so on. But they had lost contact. And I said, yes, restore family links, bam, 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 systems. Uh, give me three and a half hour, four hours, then I will uh, have used my network, and I've been in contact, and we have probably found your, your wife. He never came. But one of my colleagues, in the next point of the route, called me and said, I have a guy here that tells me that he had spoken to someone. So you have not even the time to wait for the response if I have found his wife. Uh, so we started, uh, we also had to start to invent something because we started to, to, to give them a ticket and kind of a number so we could trace them back in the system. Uh, basically, we, we was nearly reaching the point that we was using our global restore family link system that is a web portal thing where you are having a tracking number. But we started to do that on a, on a low uh, technical level. We had we have the distributions of uh, of hygiene kits. You know the Red Cross. We have boxes that we have hygiene kits. That is one of our we can do hygiene kits. So we go to our warehouse and we take our hygiene kits. It's a box like this, a nice box, and then we go to the refugees and then we say hygiene kits, depending on the size. 15 days, everything. And then he just opened the box, took up one diaper, and showed the box to the left, and then moved on. And then after the first two days, three days, we just saw this pile of boxes, leftovers. And to be honest and self-critical, uh, my organization took two weeks before we started emptying the boxes and putting up diapers here and, and toothpaste here and then they could just walk by then we could place all these boxes down the lane and then they could just go up and say okay we need one diaper and we need one toothbrush um, that minimized a lot the waste but just to say okay we was just moving into this operation we moved in one of the tools of the leaf operation handouts Hiking kids, uh, it doesn't work. And blankets don't have, must not be reused. Mm. Okay. But they handed out blankets on one post at one post, and then uh, they was not allowed to take the blankets into the to the buses. So they just dumped the blankets, and uh, then they moved on, and then they got new blankets. 
And then, of course, everyone started thinking, oh, we have a lot of blankets, so we just start reusing them. And uh, no one was really seeing this happening before we started tracking some diseases and so on. So there's a certain pattern here that some diseases are moving uh, with these reused blankets. And then the UNICEF started to say, okay, you will have this blanket at the beginning, and then you have to to take this, but they wouldn't bring them. It was not because the organizations was just forcing, enforcing this on, on, on the refugees. The refugees <coughs> was just saying, yeah, I have to choose, I have a child here, I have a child here, and now you say I have to bring five blankets. So um, there's a, there's something here, decentralize our services, uh, make our staff mobile, make our, all our services uh, mobile, uh, look, about, look, look, look into relief items, not relief sets, uh, not full packages, because they will not be able to carry full packages. Uh, more into uh, internet portals that the refugees can access. So they can go in and and use some kind of a tracking system on their own. Uh, digitalize our own document flow because a paper with a name in the harbor and <coughs> six hours later the guy is in another harbor on the other end of the island. Uh, doesn't work. So we, we need to yeah to to, to find uh, some of these uh, ways to that was the two main learning points. And then um, the last thing um, that became very, very, very visible to me. Uh, and maybe because it was in a European context. Um, the, the challenge in between our need for being legal, uh, to being a part of the system, and at the same time to have the humanitarian imperative at the top of our agenda. Um, in Greece, it's illegal to make sea rescue if you don't have a special permission from the Coast Guard or from some crazy guy in Athens. So NGOs, volunteers was busted, <laughs> put into jail because there was rescuing guys like this from drowning. And at the same time, a lot of organizations were standing on the beach looking. I don't have the answer. I just say that I have never ever been challenged so much uh, on being inside my, uh, my own organization's values and ideas of being legal. I think when we are moving in Africa, so on, we are moving the laws. There is no one to, to. Uh, there is no one to blame us. There is no one. There is no system to, to mm -hmm. follow up if we are breaking the laws. Mm -hmm. So we, we 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 push everything a little bit around. I have been into several negotiations with the guys that was trying to keep up the law, at least their perspective on the law, and then we was moving in and say, yeah, but we are doing this nevertheless. But we would never do that on Lesbos because it's a it's a totally media focused area and it's a European system. Uh, so we are just waiting for this legalization of our work. Uh, and I think everyone is challenged by that. Um, and as I said, I don't have the answer when or where you have to to break the law, but. Uh, at least we have to think about being very focused on, on this.
Unitarian Imperative as our basic, basic uh, objective of what we are doing. Yes, I have 20 minutes. Uh, so now we have minus five minutes for discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Was there any dialogue with the Greek government to minimize the... Um yeah, there was a lot of dialogue, and, and if you know a little bit about Greece and the way the, the dialogue is going, uh, there's a lot of talk. Uh, and if there's no money, and... Uh, it, it's... it's uh, the corruption is high. Um, we have to remember that there's no refugee operation that is having the opportunity of having success. You are deemed to fail. No one wants the refugees. The Greek government don't want refugees. The Danish government, the no government wants the refugees, right? So in that way, a negotiation with the Greek about establishing of a proper camp area was deemed to fail. And it did. We had a camp. We had a camping area that we could buy, but we couldn't get the, the legal uh, accept from the government to have this on the island. So, so this would be very, very slow, uh, and, and the more corrupt and, and messy that the political system is. Uh, so it was not because we was not trying, um, but sometimes you can say, what would happen if we did it nevertheless? Would they put me in the Red Cross jail, or <laughs> where would I end up, uh, or should I maybe do that? And again, I, I'm not. Uh, I fully understand that my my secretary general and the rest of the organization have a global perspective, and a lot of things they have to think about. But nevertheless, people are drowning and dying. Uh, can I confess to 13 years with UNHCR, yeah. um, dealing with very different refugees in Africa, yeah. subsistence farmers who yeah. do what they're told, and in Sri Lanka with the Danish Refugee Council in Haiti when I was there for Red Art. Obviously this is a really different sort of thing, we're talking about professional urban yeah. people. Yeah. But I wanted to talk about your pop-up NGOs because there was a very good seminar which was streamed online at the Overseas Development Institute the latter half of last year, talking about the response to Syria and the role of the pop-up NGOs in Syria, mm -hmm. many of them funded by the Syrian diaspora yeah. from all over the world, yeah. and talking about all the things you were saying and lack of accountability, blah, blah. They can't be funded <coughs> because they're not registered, they don't have a bank account, they haven't been trading for three years, they don't meet the EU criteria. They're the only people in most of Syria that's doing anything. And there's been a lot of discussion about this. I'm a logistician and yeah. the Humanitarian Logistics Association has been talking about it. <coughs> How can we try to facilitate the use of these informal groups and empower them and even capacity build without <coughs> imposing some really heavy bureaucracy on top um, and conversely how do we take the lessons of your your hygiene kits my kitchen sets um, <laughs> learning to be more casual more informal how to blur the edges between the uh, first of all bureaucracy I think we have to move volunteer. into these we have to we have to move into these pop up NGOs we have to move expats into these in we have to start acting as advisors, teachers, uh, consultants, whatever. Because my experience is that they are <coughs> asking for advice. They have one goal, to do their very, very best for the beneficiaries. Sometimes they have a little bit blurred picture of, or wrong picture of the beneficiaries. Maybe they have a, only a slice. But they have basically the driving force is that they want to do their very best. And they know that not everything they're doing are the very best. So they ask me, can we do something 
to get this place more secure, we had the staffing uh, that was basically coming because they have a lot of crossing lines in the handout of clothes and food and everything, and then in the dark night and no light. So we moved all the doors on all the buildings, so we moved the lines, and then suddenly they had a much nicer place, and they just did it. I just told them that you could do this. Um, so, so I would say, not be afraid to move in, to, 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 to offer your expertise. That doesn't mean that the Red Cross now have taken responsibility mm. for everything going inside Oxy. I have basically made a Red R operation inside, uh, inside this uh, staff is group. But you did this personally. You were there with the Red Cross, but you yeah. yourself went in. And you, I can't imagine UNHCR delegating somebody to go and work with this bunch of unwashed no. volunteers. Now, I can buy an air ticket and go to Lesbos tomorrow and offer to help. Yeah, but, but how do you do it on a more, slightly more formalized but well, less bureaucratic manner? We did it because I was, it was totally a Red Cross operation. Mm. It was not, I, I didn't took off my vest. I, I kept on my, my, my logo and my, 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 my responsibility as a Red Cross. And Eunice Yang could have do, done the, better, the same. Mm. I asked him even to, to follow me because it was a golden opportunity mm. to get all these blurred organizations organized in the Northern Park, but they didn't want to. So he was just sitting at the table, and he was a nice guy, and he was one of the good Eunice Yang guys. It was not to blame him, that, but he was in many ways uh, tied on, 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 mm. on his hands that he couldn't move, and he was probably forbidden to to engage more with them. So, so it was uh, basically, uh, they were piling up the blankets at the side of the road, and then the FED went out and took the blankets and moved them into their area. They were basically not able to, to deliver the blankets inside the area. Mm. But, but I, I, I can't see why Unity are, that cross, you name it, should not be able to, to offer this capacity uh, with the respect of the groups. The problem is, the next problem is, the IRC tried to, 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 to grab them as, as the part of their organization, and then they just did like mm -hmm. this. You have to come in and say, okay, I'm here. I know a lot about this and this and this, and if you need anything else, I can properly find someone that can, uh, can help you. Question? Yeah, hi, just to bring that, that question home a little bit, and, and Meg, you'd be happy to hear about this. Um, I was lucky enough recently to be involved in a Red R training initiative here at Red R in this office in this room <clears throat> with a bunch of organizations here in the UK who were doing the very same thing that you're talking about vis-a-vis -vis Calais. So we had three different trainings on Saturdays in a row and it was exactly the types of organizations that you had described. They weren't real organizations. They had connected with each other on social media. They had little names for themselves like Darby for Calais or Norwich for Calais. They all got in the room like, oh yeah, I met with you on social, on Twitter and you on Facebook. They were doing collections, going or getting in their cars, driving across the channel, distributing them this, this stuff in, in the jungle. And uh, so anyway, Red R held these one day trainings for them to come here and, uh, and, to, and, and to sort of actually train them a little bit on humanitarian principles. And it's fascinating because they were so hungry. Not only were they hungry to understand humanitarianism, like the guidelines by which they might do better, but they wanted really practical information like how do you do a distribution? How do you arrange it? How do you facilitate it? How do you stay safe? And um, as an old school humanitarian trainer like you, like a lot of us, I guess, I was very challenged by this, you know, nonchalant, laissez-faire approach to just, why don't we just go take a bunch of stuff over there? Because we're the professionals. We know how to do distributions. What are you doing? What are you doing, you guys? But also very heartened, you keep using this word heart, by the fact that most of them, they didn't know anyone there. They didn't have friends. They didn't know anyone who was refugees. They were absolutely driven by things like injustice, their own sense of care for these refugees that none of them had known or met. It was just an amazing few days, but I just want to say it was Red R here, it was doing that. And I think it's a nice actual model for answering part of the question, like give them some skills, give them an opportunity to get in the room, meet each other, talk to each other, and that there's been that opportunity happening here in this room that we're in.